Hello and welcome to the Royal Road School of Carmelite Prayer. We will be continuing our journey through the way of perfection today. We are in part five, which is dedicated to Teresa's commentary on the Our Father. And uh, we are focusing today on chapter 34, our daily bread, chapters 33 through 35, are dedicated to the Eucharist. So in 34, Teresa continues on the same subject, the Eucharist. The matter is very helpful also with regard to the time immediately following reception of the most blessed sacrament. In this petition, the word daily seems to mean forever. Reflecting on why, after the word daily, the Lord said, Give us this day, that it be ours every day. I have come to believe that on earth we will possess him, and also in heaven we will possess him, if we profit well by his company. He doesn't remain with us for any other reason than to help encourage and sustain us in doing this will that we have prayed might be done within us. In saying this day, it seems to me he means one day, one day that lasts as long as the world and no longer. As for the unfortunate ones who will be condemned, it will not be the Lord's fault if they allow themselves to be conquered, as he never stops encouraging them until the battle is over. So the son tells his father that because there is one day, the father should let him pass it in servitude. He asks again for no more than to be with us this one day, because it is a fact that he has given us this most sacred bread forever. His majesty gave us the manna and the nourishment of his humanity that we might find him and not die of hunger. The soul will find delight and consolation in the most blessed sacrament. I don't want to think he had in mind the bread used for bodily nourishment. The Lord was in the most sublime contemplation. So would he have placed so much emphasis on the petition that he as well as ourselves eat? It just just wouldn't make sense to me. He is teaching us to set our wills on heavenly things and to ask that we might begin to enjoy him here below. So would he get involved with something so base as asking to eat? He knows that once we start worrying about bodily needs, those of the soul will be forgotten. There is no need or trial or persecution that is not easy to suffer if we begin to enjoy the delight and consolation of this sacred bread. Ask the Father, daughters, together with the Lord, to give you your spouse this day so that you will not be seen in this world without him. To temper such great happiness, it is sufficient that he remained disguised in these accidents of bread and wine. This is torment enough for anyone having no other love than him, nor any other consolation. Beg him not to fail you and to give you the disposition to receive him worthily. Don't worry about the other bread There are other times for working and earning your bread. Have no fear that you will be in want of bread if you have sincerely surrendered yourselves to the will of God. 
if I fail in this surrender, as I have many, many times, I would not beg that he give me this bread or anything else to eat. Just let me die of hunger. Why would I want life if I am daily gaining eternal death? Carefully avoid wasting your thoughts on what you will eat. Let the body work. It is good to work to sustain yourself. Let your soul be at rest. Leave this care to your spouse. He will care for you always. Your attitude should be like that of a servant when he begins to serve. His care is solely about pleasing his master in everything. In return, the master is obliged to provide his servant with food. So it wouldn't be right for this servant to go about asking for food. But let us, sisters, ask the Eternal Father that we might merit to receive our heavenly bread in such a way that the Lord may reveal himself to the eyes of our soul and so make himself known since our bodily eyes cannot delight in beholding him because he is hidden. Such knowledge is another kind of delightful sustenance that maintains life. Do you think that this heavenly food fails to provide sustenance, even for these bodies, that it is not a great medicine, even for bodily ills? Well, I know that it is. I know a person with great pain who through this bread had them taken away and was completely well, completely healed. The wonders this most sacred bread brings about in those who worthily receive it are well known. When she heard people say they would have liked to have lived at the time of Christ our good, walk the earth, she would laugh to herself and she wondered what more they wanted since the most blessed sacrament, they had him just as truly present as he was then. For many years when she received communion, and though she was far from being perfect, she strove to strengthen her faith so that in receiving her Lord, it was as if with her bodily eyes, she saw him enter her house. Since she believed that this Lord truly entered her her poor, poor home, she freed herself from all exterior things when it was possible and entered to be with him. She strove to recollect the senses so that they all took notice of so great a good. I mean that they would not impede the soul from recognizing him. She considered herself at his feet and wept with the Madeline, as if she were seeing him with her bodily eyes. And even though she didn't feel devotion, faith told her that he was indeed there. Receiving communion is not like picturing with the imagination, as when we reflect on an episode of our Lord's Passion. In communion, the event is happening now, right now, and it is entirely true. There is no reason to look for him elsewhere. Since we know Jesus is with us, we should approach him now if when he went about in this world, the mere touch of his robes cured the sick. Why doubt, if we have faith, that miracles will be worked while he is within us 
and that he will give us what we ask of him, since he is in our house. His majesty is not accustomed to paying poorly for his lodging, if the hospitality is good. If it pains you not to see him with your bodily eyes, consider that seeing him so is not fitting for us. To see him in his glorified state is different from seeing him as he was when he walked through the world. No person would be capable of enduring such a glorious sight. In seeing this eternal truth, one would see that all the things we pay attention to here below are simply lies and jokes. Beneath that bread, he is easy to deal with. If a king of the world were disguised, it wouldn't matter to us at all if we conversed with him without awe and respect. Otherwise, Who would it dare approach him so unworthily, with so much lukewarmness, and with so many imperfections? How we fail to know what we are asking for, he reveals himself to those who he sees will benefit by his presence. Even though they fail to see him with their bodily eyes, He has many methods of showing himself to the soul through great interior feelings and other ways. Be with him willingly. Don't lose so good an occasion for conversing with him as in the hour after having received communion. If obedience should command something, sisters, Strive to leave your soul with the Lord. If you immediately turn your thoughts to other things and take no account of the fact that he is within you, how, I ask, will he be able to reveal himself to you? This is a good time for our master to teach us, for us to listen to him, to kiss his feet because he wanted to teach us and beg him not to leave. If you have to pray to him by looking at his picture, it would seem foolish to me. You would be leaving the person himself in order to look at a picture of him. Wouldn't it be silly if a person we love very much and of whom we have a portrait came to visit us and we stopped speaking with the person in order to carry on a conversation with the portrait? It is good, however, to have a picture of Christ when he is absent. That's true. It's a comfort to see an image of one whom we have so much reason to love. Wherever I turn my eyes, I would want to see his image, the one who loves us so much. After receiving the Lord, since you have the person himself present, strive to close the eyes of your body and to open those of the soul and to look into your own heart. You should acquire the habit of doing this each time you receive communion and strive to enjoy this blessing frequently. Though he comes disguised, it does not prevent him from being recognized in many ways in conformity with the desire we have to see him. You can desire to see him so much that he will reveal himself to you entirely. If, on the other hand, we pay no attention to him and go seeking worldly things, what is there for the master to do? 
Must he force us to see him, since he wants so badly to reveal himself to us? No, because they didn't treat him so well when he let himself be seen openly by all and clearly told them who he was. Very few were those who believed him. He is being merciful by letting us know that he is present in the most blessed sacrament. He doesn't want to show himself openly, communicate his grandeurs to us, and give his treasures, except to those who he knows desire him greatly. These are his true friends, those who are not his true friends and do not draw near to him to receive him as such will never trouble him with requests that he reveal himself. This person will leave and quickly forget about what took place, hurrying on to other business affairs, other occupations, and other worldly activities so that the Lord of the universe, the Lord of the house, may not occupy it. Amen.